looking forward to one last hit out before we dive into qualifying and uh, another 100 plus kilometres of action later today. Looking up towards the skies, it's the closest thing I've seen open to a cloud exit, since I got it here on open. Wednesday, Mark Scaife. It is just another perfect day in Perth. You can never get sick of this weather over here. Unseasonably warm though, I might add, for late May as we open up beat the ultimate pit lane. And uh, this was once upon a time, back in the 90s, the regular thing to have a, a Sunday morning warm-up. We only really get these at Sandown and Bathurst these days. But a hit out here, and good news for the crowd that is filling this venue to see the supercars out on track. And one last systems check. Good morning to you, Mark. Good morning, Chad. And it feels a bit cooler. Uh, it says my weather map says 21.6 feels like 15 mm -hmm. and a strong northerly, so much different wind direction today. We are north of the city of Perth, right on the banks of the Swan River. You head up the Mitchell Freeway. It used to feel like quite the journey, but suburbia has crept ever so close to this racetrack <laughs> these days as well. It's a ripper venue. It's fast. It's pretty flat out. And as we saw yesterday, it's wild. It certainly is. It's a real ball ring. That's the way I explain it. And on behalf of Pizza Hut, let's have a look at it because it's 2.4K, only seven turns, so it looks quite simple, but it's far from simple. It's got real character about it. It's got great rise and fall. It's got big, long corners, especially down there in the blue zone. You can see there, turn six in the second sector. That cold corner, you're in that corner for just over 10 seconds. So top speed about 255K and a very, very hard racetrack to make the car work on because of the low grip nature of it. The signatures of this track are the sand and the big hill that they're cresting right now, which is funny, Rihanna, for a track that is in a city that is famously flat as Perth. We've got one of the biggest hills anywhere you'll find on the tour. Good morning to our pit reporters. And do we love it, Chad? Well, Matt Stone Racing, they've had an up and down weekend so far. They had Cam Hill had damage earlier in the weekend. Then yesterday qualified really strong, position six, but had an off in the dying lap of yesterday's race, tumbling down the order. I spoke to him this morning. He actually was trying to pass his teammate, Nick Perkett, and just stuffed up. He was desperate to get past as he'd lost some laps earlier in the, uh, in the race and just made a mistake. So they've got pace this weekend, so look for them for the uh, afternoon's race. Wow, look at all these pit stops going on straight away in this practice session. Now, another one to look out for is James. Have I got a deal for you, Courtney, the new Gold Coast real estate agent, yeah? That's him. Six yesterday. What a fantastic result for the over 40s club. I asked Matty Nielsen, Teco as we know him, where did that speed come from? He said, hard work. And we all know, can't beat hard work. Team 18 had a tough day at the office yesterday. Dave Reynolds was actually on for a very good lap in the second phase of qualifying that would have vaulted him to the front of that session. Made a mistake leaving turn six, tried to overcompensate at turn seven, went out of bounds, lost that, lost that lap time, consigned him to the back of the grid. Mark Winterbottom had no new tyre again, could not get the car to hook up. And then this team was a classic example of Perth. You don't qualify well, you're stuck at the back and you can't fight to the front. Thank you, Garth. Mark and Rihanna down in pit lane. It'll be a very busy pit lane with just 16 and a bit minutes to go in this one. The rule, only driver that got moving in yesterday's race, Scaifey, was Thomas Randall up from 17th to 10th. They did have some good speed in qualifying. He just got pinged for uh, jumping the kerb. So not too many to highlight Garth's point can get from the back of the grid up through the field here. And that spot there is where you're referring to Chad with the out of bounds nature of running out around that exit kerb. And as soon as you do that, as Garth was explaining, that was the issue for David Reynolds. It was also the issue that you were talking about with Thomas Randall. I'm interested with those pit stops. So we've done a real synopsis of all the pit stops yesterday. Two tyres fastest stop was Mostert with a 3.3. Four tyres fastest stop was Will Brown with a 7.7. .7. So everyone already looking at how you optimise the day, and there's a real divergence. If, and I heard Gus say yesterday, if Will Brown was able to qualify better and then put the four tyres on, not having to deal with Ryan Wood in the race yesterday, might have been a different result. Yeah, it was one of those weird days where two tyres was the strategy that won, but it might not have necessarily been the best strategy. Yeah. You could even see Walkinshaw and Dreddy United changing their mind back and forward before they even made that call. Chas Moss have talked about it in the post-race press conference yesterday, that they'll go back and look at see if it actually was the right move to make. And, and that gamesmanship, I think it's the first time we've seen it really as a 
a really provocative, controversial thing that was going on in the in the lane because teams were running up and down the lane looking for how many tyres that other teams had outside. And that whole thing that you just spoke about, four tyres or two or even three, some did three tyres, will be a big part of the talking that we're going through in the race this afternoon. Lucker? Right on cue, Scabie. Will Davis has just come in. So left rear, right front. Left front, right rear, there's four. Now, just prior to this, Anton Di Pasquale came through and they practiced two tyres. So a lot of teams are onto this, as you've been talking about it. We're going to have a little bit of a closer look at it in the Eno a little later on. It is absolutely a strategy. I counted Anton stopped there before about three and a half seconds. And as you can see, these are about seven or eight seconds. It's a big gain. Uh, for sure. And I, I think sometimes we discount how much work the inside or the unloaded side of the car does. So at that corner there, for instance, around the big long left-hander at turn four, clearly the inside tyre, the right-hand side tyres, unloaded side, do a lot of work. But in terms of traction and braking grip, so do the unloaded side tyres. So on the way to the corner, right there at Cole, and then the way off the corner when you're trying to straighten the exit up and make the right-hand side rear tyre work, that actually has quite a profound effect on the tyre longevity and the pace. Now, we talked earlier, Mark, about these Sunday morning sessions. Typically, you'd only get them at Sandown and Bathurst, and it would be 100% about a systems check for the race, pit stop practice and finding race balance. But there's still another qualifying session to go here today as the two BJR boys get a little bit close coming through turn six. That's done with the pizza hut having a lock up down into the bowl. So I wonder if anyone's still tinkering with qualifying pace and set up for later today? Uh, I think for sure. I mean, if it was me at Red Bull, I'd be more aggressive with trying to make it a qualifying car. Uh, because we saw yesterday, one lap for Mostert at the end was the, was the real marker of the day. He had almost two tenths of a second on the field. The other thing that's really important, and I've never seen it, but at this venue, we had 0.38 of a second separate, which is unbelievable, Three and a half tenths, basically, separate 24 cars. <laughs> Which makes the two tenths first to second in that last session seem even more extraordinary. Yeah. That's a battering around here. Jackson Evans at the wheel. Had a chance to drive the Arise Racing Ferrari around here. It's the first car that he actually got to drive around Wanneroo before hopping into the supercar for this week. Lucko? Really busy down here in the Red Bull garage. Just actually switch your swing around. So behind me, you can see underneath Feeney's car. Looks like they're mucking around with probably front anti roll bar there. But more importantly, Will Brown came in here behind me with a lot of smoke coming off his right front tyre. Richie, let's have a look over this side. They've, uh, they've now got it back on, but there seemed to be something going on where it was dragging, a lot of smoke coming out. The boys have been in there having a look at the caliper. They're rotating the wheel around. I mean, no one working on it now. That's probably a good sign. There certainly was a little drama there. Let's keep our eye on that. As they look, firing a set of rear springs into the rear of the car at the same time. Thank you, Mark. So that sort of answers the question. There is definitely some tuning still going on. 12-minute blast to the chequered flag. Difficult day for Shelby Power Racing. Will Davison gave a really good interview at the end of yesterday, just sort of looking philosophically back on the day. Ended up with uh, a throttle sensor issue. That meant he would finish practically second last, but really the pace wasn't there for them yesterday. And I, I saw the interview that Neil Crompton did with the DJR guys, it was Ryan Story and Anton and Will, and I thought Will spoke really well about the team and where they're at, the amount of work in getting Gen 3 up and running as the homologation team, and the way that he had to apply himself off the back of the Penske era with the team in its current structure. So there was, was actually a really good interview yesterday. I think Will's, he's got a, he's in a good brain space. Although it's tough, he's in a good brain space. He's currently fastest. Cropper? Uh, just down here in the Erebus garage, Mark, and Brody Kostecki, our reigning champion, remember, came back in New Zealand at our last event. Shocking day for him yesterday. He got punted down at turn one, and then they ran him really long and late in the race, ended up finishing in 22nd position. He's jumped out of the blocks pretty quickly this morning. I know he's tumbling down the times now as more people have fed out. He's just gone back out the lane with that retro livery on the car. They've made a bunch of little changes to the front of the car, and he was in the top half dozen cars before they just exited the pit lane. I think he's dropped down just outside the top ten now, but that car looks like it's better today. Yeah, good news, because that car didn't respond well yesterday, and I was a bit fathomed. There's, I, I couldn't get my brain around, couldn't fathom the 
policy to run so long. I, I thought it might have been around keeping some tyres for today, but the way that the degradation worked out, not much use. That's sort of what they said about it. Was yeah. It was a loose way of hanging on to some tyres for today, but also if they caught a late race safety car, they would have had fresh rubber for it. But it was one of those things. He was so far back at the end of lap one, they were destined to finish back there. Not yeah. a lot they could have done without any help from the BP Pulse safety car yesterday. And with the other car... Uh, conking out on the grid. It was just about as bad a day as they could have asked for yesterday for Jack LeBrock. Young Aaron Love up six spots up to third. I spoke to him this morning and was still working on the car. He's got a lack of confidence in the braking areas, especially getting the car pitched when he first applies the brake. One of the real keys to driving well at this venue is to be able to grab the brake as hard as you can on a low grip surface and get the pitch of the car right so that you can start to bleed the brake away as you get to the corner and trail the brake to the corner nicely. And Aaron Love, compared to James Courtney, has been working on that as a technique and he's just come up. He's now fifth, so Matty Payne's gone very fast. Mostert now has gone to the top, as we probably would expect with a 55.08 on board now with young Aaron. I, I felt sorry for him yesterday, Chad. He was just in the wrong spot at the wrong time with Richie Stanaway, and the contact was not avoidable for him right there. He said in his post-qualifying one outage yesterday that he felt he didn't put it all together. Certainly you were, you were crawling over his sector times after practice, and you were licking your lips a bit at what the, the day might hold for him. It certainly didn't work out that way. So can he put it together today is the question for Aaron Love. He sits six as Mostert gives us today's first 54. Expect a few more of those in Boost Mobile qualifying when we get into it. We dipped into the 54s in practice yesterday and then that was considered to be... You need, you need one of those to get out of that first session in the end of the day. Yeah, that's right. Got real quick yesterday. It was like that in the Dunlop series as well, right from that qualifying session in Super 2. You could tell the racetrack was going to be a quick one. And I imagine with all 130 k's worth of rubber yesterday, zero uh, chance of any rain overnight as well. It'll be a pretty quick racetrack today again. And it's cooler. Yeah. So again, a little bit of the wind direction will be interesting to see how that works because it's effectively a headwind on the nose of the car on the pit straight as the pit straight runs effectively north-south. So Mostert fastest with a 54.98. Will Brown, 55.07. Will Davison, Brock Feeney, Matt Payne, Aaron Love, Dick Squally, Hill, Stanaway and Heimgartner. It does look like the BJR cars are a little stronger first thing this morning because Bryce Ford was right up there straight away and now Heimgartner's gone a little bit quicker too with a 55.3. Let's get to Laco. Let's have a look at this pit stop here. This is really interesting. So Woody just came through the pit lane, his teammate. This is Mostert. Both of them did two tyres yesterday. Both of them in both stops practicing four tyres today. So I don't know if that's a little throw everyone out of whack, what's going to go on here. Everyone else will be trying it on today, but isn't that interesting? They're not practicing two. And remember, we've only got two guns. That's why you're seeing the guys put on one tyre and run up to the other end of the car. In endurance races, we can have four. Here, we've only got two. Car rolling into the garage is Richie Stanaway. Just to put a full stop on that story yesterday with the change of the fuel control unit at the end of the day that triggered that incident on the Looking at the data here in the garage, all clear, all good is the word from David Couchy. That's good news. It's a, uh, a pesky part of the car for that team. Unfortunately, took them out of action in Portimao. The fuel pump, actually both fuel pumps on that car, unfortunately failing for Grove Racing in Portugal. But cool to see them continuing their international racing program as well as the uh, heavy domestic program that they've got here in supercars. Cam Hill's gone quite quickly. He's come up to sixth position. And what a great story after that big shunt at turn three on Friday afternoon. And they were able to not only get into the top 10 in boost mobile, mobile qualifying yesterday, they were right up there. They were sixth and almost exactly the same time as what the Red Bull Empire Camaros were able to achieve. Neil? One of the big stories this weekend, Mark, and everywhere you look up and down the lane, this is what's going on. People checking and rechecking tyre pressures. Between New Zealand and this event, the Supercars Commission determined to drop the minimum tyre pressure from 17 to 15 psi. The net effect yesterday was though Dunlop soft tyres were incredibly consistent and there was only a three to four tenths of a second variation. So managing this is as much a performance influencer as making changes on the car. So everybody up and down here at the moment learning a lot about that. 
It's a big point, isn't it? So 15 PSI now. And what they were doing yesterday too was they were putting them out in the sun and continuing to bleed them off. So if you actually went and got the tyre pressure after they'd cooled off, they'd have a lot less than that. So the way that the teams were trying to optimise that new rule, still the same games being applied, but the way that they were doing it was trying to almost superheat the tyre by being in the sun before they end up putting it back to 15 PSI. Important day for Tickford yesterday, not just for the monster energy car of Cam Waters, but both of them combined inside the top ten, moved them to fourth in the team's championship. So that's a little step up towards the, the pointier end of pit lane where they'd like to be. Walkinshaw and Dreddy United marched all the way to second yeah. yesterday. So that could be a very different looking lane again when we get to Darwin. Chas Mostert had only positive things to say at the press conference yesterday about the live pit lane rules for this year. Yeah, I mean, it's just another feature of the entertainment, isn't it? And I think for fans and especially patrons that come to the racetrack, the, the way you have always looked at who's the top team is the team that's at the end of the pit lane. So to now go, OK, well, that's at the moment, it's Red Bull Empire Racing, but based on what we've seen from yesterday, Walkinshaw is now alongside them. Previously, Penrite was. So you, you look at it now and you can actually just go straight away, it's another feature of understanding the pecking order of the industry. I was sort of blown away when I went to Bathurst for the first time at the beginning of the year and you see how far up BJR were that week. It's like, it shows you just how good they're going. Conversely to that were in New Zealand the other day, and the closest to pit entry I've ever seen, Shelby Power Racing. Yeah. And plus added motivation for the teams at that side to get moving towards the other side, which Shelby Power Racing were able to do in New Zealand. But it's just a graphical example. So this young man was man of the match yesterday. 20 years of age, rookie, did a superb job here in the development series last year. I remember you and Garth raving about his drive here last year. Come out, put on the front row of the group. But what he did yesterday, which was really important, to try to get the best eclectic lap, to put all your best sectors together, he did an 80% lap as his first lap, and then a rip, tear, and bust second lap. Oof. Now, he's got a lot of traffic to deal with there, and that will oh. hurt him. That's going to hurt him. So that's wrecked his lap, and he'd be angry about that because the guys should have been across that. So he they should have moved it over to the mate. outside. So, if you want to go and have another go. so he was about to go again, and what he'd be thinking is, why didn't you blokes drive down the left-hand side of the road down there and let me have a go at the right-hander? So he will be fuming in that helmet. But what a really good job yesterday, Neil. Business end of this practice session, so I'll be brief. Chas Mostert, who's quickest at the moment in the 54s, has jumped out of the car. Jess asked the question before we came to this session, would they fiddle with it? And I checked with Sam Scafidi. They did make minor adjustments to both the front and the rear car, specifically for qualifying, because they think the track will evolve, and he's happy he's left out. Thanks, Neil, for the update down there. Now, we've just done the numbers. That lap at that point, before the balk, he was going to go to fourth. Okay. Right, so Mostert's fastest was a 54.98. He would have been in the low 55s, would have gone to fourth. That fork put him to 16th. Lucky at the moment, it's practice. If that happens later today in that first qualifying session with a busy racetrack, that will have serious ramifications. Steve Squally jumps up inside the 10. I'm going to sign here, both walking short cars again looking quick. One of them only needed 17 minutes out of the 20 in this session. That's how good Chas Mostert's looking at the moment. He does come up 19 positions. He goes to fifth, but he would have also overpressured based on that, having another lap to contend with. So that was difficult for Ryan. But I'll tell you what was also impressive is sometimes when you're a young bloke, it's easy to be too energised when you have that roadblock in front. It could easily run down the inside, fire across the kerb, run into the car in front. It could be... Uh, a kerfuffle. Yep. It wasn't. Yep. He backed it off. He didn't like it. He parked up alongside Aaron Love. I'm sure he made a couple of hand gestures, <laughs> but he got back on with it. His team have dealt with him really well. That The radio correspondence with him through the weekend has been excellent. Better signs here for Shelby Power Racing inside the last minute. Will Davison second. Anton is in seventh. Team 18 talked about their woes yesterday. They're currently 22nd and 24th. Hard to get a read on what program they're working on here. Race car, a qualifying car. James Courtney continues his good form. He's inside the 10. Will Brown, that time, 
three tenths down and his quickest in the session, which came about four laps ago. 30 seconds. Bryce Ford's one of the only remaining drivers with Nick Perkett out there that's still on a hot lap. This will be their last one of the session. Yeah, he was passed immediately. When this session commenced, he went right up to the top. He was fourth or fifth. We'll see what this does for him with the lights on. Just slightly slower than his earlier lap, a 55.39, only four one hundredths away from the number that he did earlier. Jackson Evans comes up three Check positions. Flag, close pit exit. And pit exit is now closed. just looking there, Nick Perkat down in 20th. But again, the whole field, if you get down to James Golding in 21st, he's only four tenths of a second away, 0.41 from Mostert. So we're going to see a very exciting Boost Mobile qualifying coming up next because just to get through the first segment of qualifying, you need to be within three or four tenths of a second. Big smile there, Bruce Stewart. And I'm sure those guys are very happy again. He's been at the top of the pops since they've wheeled that car out, which is always a good sign, Chad. Probably highlighted even more, Mark, by the fact that this has not been a good place for them the last couple of years. It felt like the last couple of years here, though, a better chance of locking out the rear of the grid than the front of the grid. But this year, substantially different. Those tight margins are back. Have a look at that. First through third, less than a tenth. That's as high up as we've seen Thomas Randall on the scorecard so far this week as well. Ryan Wood's not too far away from his teammate. Both the Shell V-Power cars have got a turn of pace there. Matt Payne, he's been about that mark all weekend long, somewhere around the back of the top 10. Aaron Love, he's a chance. That's closer yep. to his teammate. Wouldn't he love to get out of Q1 today? That'd be a good story for him. And uh, I wonder what they're thinking down at Team 18 at the moment. If they're going to read too much into that. It's a little bit of a margin there. One last hit out before we dive into Boost Mobile qualifying. A rare Sunday practice session. Turning it back to the 90s when we had the old morning warm up before the three race sprints back here. The man with the orange numbers once again is Will Brown. And again, looking quick as well. He was first of the four tyre stoppers yesterday. He's parked his. 87 at the top of this sheet, third overall. We went into more pit stop practice, as Larko pointed out. Both of the Walkinshaw and Dreddy United cars, despite changing two tyres yesterday, decided to practice changing four tyres in these stops. Is that a little form guide as to what's to come later today? Ryan Wood and that truck assist number two would finish his day in fifth, but it might have been a little bit higher had it not been for this awkward moment down at the bowl, trying to peel his way through what was some heavy Sunday morning traffic in the west. Mark may be thinking that he had uh, one or two quiet hand gestures to the young West Aussie alongside him. This is better from Shelby Power Racing today. Will Davison's parked car number 17 inside the top three. Anton Di Pasquale is not too far behind him. But as he has been for just about the entire weekend, it's the Optus 25, Chaz Mostert, just looking so comfortable. Got out of that car with about three to four minutes to go in the session as well. And he's parked it at the top, the only driver sub 55 seconds and definitely the driver to beat when we get into qualifying. Beautiful day once again, a little bit of a northerly breeze pushing the flags up towards the S's as they roll the cars back into the garages. I'm absolutely looking forward to qualifying a little later today.